Well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Rowski, and I'll be your host for today. For those who might be new to Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, we're all about bringing science, adventure, exploration, and conservation live into classrooms across North America and beyond. So if you head over to exploringbytheseat.com, you can find 30, 40, even 50 live events a month uh, for classrooms to tune in live, join in in camera spots, and interact. So uh, today we are celebrating World Migratory Bird Day. So we've been talking to scientists and explorers around the world who are studying bird migration, studying the way it's changing, studying some of the, the hazards uh, that migratory birds do face. So I'm really excited today to be joined by Benjamin Van Doren. Benjamin uh, studies avian migration. He focuses on understanding what drives change and flexibility in their behavior when migrating. So since 2012, he's worked with the BirdCast project to study and predict large-scale migratory movements, including researching how light pollution can affect uh, migratory birds. He's hoping to develop and deploy sensors to reveal individual interactions and responses to light pollution during migratory flights. So let's bring Benjamin in here live with us. Benjamin, how are you doing today? Great. Great to be here. Thanks for having me, Joe. All right. Awesome. Well, it's great to have you joining us uh, live today. We're excited to get to know you and your work a little better. Uh, so I'm going to let you take over for a little bit. Perfect. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you all for, for coming. Um, so my name is Benjamin, and uh, today I'm going to tell you a little bit about my work on bird migration. Um, so uh, I guess I'd, I'd love to uh, start out with a, a quick question um, for those of you who who are online live. Um, how many of you have, have seen um, a bird today or in the last couple of days or even the last week? A few? Okay, great. Yeah, so currently many of, of these birds that we are seeing at this time of year in the fall are in the middle of, of really long journeys, really long trips, um, heading to warmer areas to spend the winter. And so these, these long journeys are called migrations. Um, and this is something that I have been working on for a really long time. I've been captivated since I was a little little kid, um, I got interested in birds when I was in, um, really was when I was in the third grade, I think. Um, so similar age to, to many of you, I think. Um, and uh, I've been working on it ever since practically. So um, here we go. So many different kinds of, of birds migrate. Um, and I just wanna make sure, sorry, so Joe, um, does the screen appear fine to you? It looked it looked a little split to me on the. Um, yeah, it did kind uh, of like a low a slow changeover, but okay. Uh, well, let's try right. a couple slides and see if it goes for us. Okay, perfect. So um, so there are many different different kinds of of birds that are are migratory, representing hundreds of different species, and these are just a few of the the ones um, in in North America um, that we see on, on the slide now. And they spend most of their time active during the day, like, like you and me. They sleep at night. Um, and uh, that's for most of the year, because something very special happens at, at this time of year. Um, in the spring and in the fall, uh, when the sun sets, instead of going to sleep, um, many of these birds will uh, take off into the night sky and embark on what can be a really long flight of, of hundreds of miles in a night um, towards the place that they will go for the winter. Um, so I'm guessing that not many of you have, have seen a bird flying at night. <laughs> um, certainly I haven't seen very many myself um, because it, it's tricky to do when, when the sun's not out, of course. But um, one way that we can um, is that okay, Joe? Sorry. <laughs> it's, okay. it's okay, Ben. Um, okay. Let's try and share in a different way. Sometimes um, it can just be tricky. Why don't we try and stop the screen share? All right. And try sharing your entire screen this time. And that might get the um, 
them transitioning a little more smoothly. Well, the, it's the, it, it's not the the transitions are. I'm fine with the slow transition, but it just seemed like the screen might have been split half and yeah, half. It, it kind of goes half and then gives us three quarters, and it seems to hold there. Um, okay. So All let's right. just let's try in that different way, and that might be a little more smooth uh, for the transition. Okay, that right. looks nice and full screen. Let's give that a go. Great. Okay. So um, yeah, so one way we can see birds migrating at night is to look at the moon because um, the moon is of course lit up at night. And if we're, we're really lucky, we can see birds migrating in front of the moon um, that are on these really long flights. So we'll see if, if, if this works at all. But um, if you look closely, you can see on, on this video, um, a couple of birds, both high and low, flying across the face of the moon. And these birds are, are in their, their active migratory flights. Um, and if you, if you listen closely as well at night, you can also hear these migratory birds as they are flying overhead because you, um, they'll give very soft um, little chip notes that uh, if you're in a quiet area and um, you, you listen really hard, you can often hear. Um, as they they fly high above, so it's I think it's really amazing that all this happens when um, when most of us are sleeping and and we had no idea really, or I had no idea, especially when I was just starting out, that um, this kind of thing happens high above above our sleeping heads. So um, whoops, there we go. So we can uh, get a, a picture of a bird migration across the United States using some. Um, some tracking technologies that, I, that I've been working with. Um, and I just wanted to show you a map here to give a sense for how, how big the phenomenon is. So in, in this image of the United States, uh, those bright yellow areas on the right in the east are areas where our, our live migration tracker um, shows that um, there are millions of birds migrating um, at the same time. Um, a little bit less going on in the western part of the US, but, but still a lot. Um, and all these birds are, are heading south for, for the winter. And this is just from a couple of weeks ago, this, this image. Um, these birds are, are heading towards Mexico, towards Central America, South America. Um, and it'll take them um, a few weeks to maybe even longer uh, in some cases to, to get from the start to the end of, of their trip. Um, we can also uh, try to predict ahead of time to forecast, like, like forecasting the weather, how many birds are, are going to be migrating on a particular night, which I think is really cool. And in this, this image, we are, um, are forecasting um, migration of nearly 600 million birds across the, the United States. Um, and so that is a, a huge number um, and a number that it isn't easy to, to wrap your head around. Uh, but if you counted one bird every second, it would take you 19 years to count to 600 million. <laughs> so that just gives you an idea of, of how enormous these bird migrations are. And again, there are, are lots of different species of different colors and, and shapes. Um, and uh, I'm not, can you see my cursor um, if I move it around or is that not shown? Uh, try move it for us. Um, no. That's all right. Uh, yeah. Okay, no, no problem. But um, like some of the names of the birds that I'm showing here are uh, so all the way on the left. The the yellow one with the black hood is called a hooded warbler. Um, funnily enough, um, you might recognize an American robin in the middle left, which is the a bird you could find on, on many of your um, your lawns um, or fields in in the United States or, or Canada. Um, but all of these birds go to, to different places to spend the winter. Um, and I wanted to show you one here called the American Red Start, which um, is a, a jet black bird with brilliant orange patches um, on its sides, as you can see on the right. And, and these birds, they spend the winter in, um, in the purple areas on the map, which are in Mexico and, and the Caribbean, especially Cuba, and also Northern South America. But in the summer, um, as, as spring comes, they, they move north very quickly. So now we can see the purple all over um, the US and Canada, spend the summer there, and then come back 
um, to spend the winter again further south. So that was just a whole year that we saw. Um, and I'll see it again. These birds really move across huge areas um, and cover vast distances to do so. And, and the reason they do this is because in the winter, it gets too cold um, for them to find bugs and insects, which are, are what they, they eat most of the time. So since there are no, no bugs um, in, in Canada and northern, the northern US in the winter, they, they come south um, to, to places where it's warmer. Um, and these birds weigh only about as much as a pencil. So you can imagine there's these little tiny birds that would easily fit in the palm of your hand um, flying really long distances um, back and forth each year is just, I think, really cool. Um, they are facing some, some challenges, um, especially as, uh, as people um, change the, the landscape and, um, and, and the atmosphere. So one thing that, that people at, at Cornell, um, where I work, have, have um, estimated is that we've lost um, almost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. So birds are, are in a bit of trouble now. Um, so we have to learn um, about things we can do to protect them. And, and thankfully, there are some, some things we can do to help migratory birds on their journeys. Um, and one of them involves light at night. So birds evolved in areas um, where you wouldn't find any light on the ground and in times where you wouldn't find any lights on the ground um, at night when they're migrating. You could, the only lit um, parts of, of the uh, world they would, they would find are, are the moon or the stars or, or, of course, the sun during the day. But at night, um, finding lights on the ground is somewhat confusing to them. Um, and we find that when there are lights that are, are shown from the ground, the birds may get confused when they're migrating or, or fly towards it. Um, and uh, sometimes this can can put them in, in a bit of trouble. So here in, in this uh, video on the right, um, I'm showing a, uh, a video of thousands of birds that are, are flying around in some light beams that are, are shown north in New York City, or sorry, shown upwards into the sky in New York City. Um, and all of those, those white dots flying around are, are migratory birds that have, have become attracted to the lights. Um, and this can um, pose a problem for them, especially if, if there are buildings nearby or other, um, other structures or towers that they could potentially collide with. Um, and we think that, unfortunately, millions of birds each year hit buildings um, and houses and other, other structures um, and unfortunately don't make it. So um, one thing we can do is to protect birds is to turn off lights at night during the migration seasons of the spring and the fall um, to help them go safely on their way. Now I just wanna to finish up by, by giving you an example of how much there is still to learn about migratory birds. And to do that, I want to um, show you or tell you about a, a migration mystery that I've been working on um, in England, in Europe in the last few years. Um, and the, this mystery involves this bird you can see on, on your screen called the black cap. Um, it's a, a small songbird. Um, and uh, what's interesting about them is they suddenly appeared in the winter in England, a place where they didn't used to spend the winter. And I wanted to know why um, why they are are suddenly now spending the winter in this area, and where they're coming from, um, because we know they're they're migrating from somewhere, but uh, weren't sure exactly where they were coming from or, or why they ended up um, in the UK. Um, so this involved me needing to to catch these birds in order to to put a little tracking device on them to to see where they go to follow them, um, and so. I had to think uh, creatively about how to, to catch these, these little birds um, that are um, often uh, not very bold, a little shy, and so they're, they're not, not too easy to, to catch. Um, but they, they do really enjoy food that, that you can put out in your backyard. So here's the black cap um, in the video was just feeding on some, some food we put out in the backyard. Um, 
And uh, we took this a step further. And on the, on the left is a, a man that I worked with named Graham. And he figured out that these birds, their favorite food was um, a type of cake called Victoria sponge cake. <laughs> um, and so he figured out that if you put this cake in a, a little cage and a little feeder, um, that the birds would, would come to it and that we could uh, design a little door to fall um, and trap the bird to, to be able to uh, put a little tracking device on it um, when we wanted to. So on the right is a, a, a picture of the little, the cage that we use to try and um, attract these birds. And so when I was catching them, I, I sat inside. Um, you can see on the right, uh, a picture of me in front of my little telescope that I use to, to watch the birds and a remote control in my left hand. So when the birds came to uh, the trap, um, when they came to feed in the trap from, from the sponge cake, I could press a button and a door would fall and I could um, catch the bird. Um, hopefully ending up, ending up with it, uh, something like this on the right um, with me holding a black cap. Um, we did all sorts of uh, different science, types of science and measurements on, on the birds, including measuring their wings, which I'm doing on the right here, um, or the, the beaks um, on the bottom left, um, and uh, lots of other, other things like weight and um, measurements of their legs. And then we put the, the tracking device on it. Um, they wear these like a little backpack. So you could think of these as little, little bird backpacks that the, the birds wear. Um, and the trick though, is that when we, we put on the backpack and, and send them off, um, in order to figure out where the bird has gone, we have to catch the same exact bird a year later to, um, to take off the backpack and, and see where the bird had gone. Um, so this was a bit tricky for me because I had to um, catch a bird, put on the device, let it go, wait an entire year, and then try to catch the very same bird again. And, and that was tricky. <laughs> um, but thankfully, I managed to, to do that with, with some of them. And I just want to show a, a map of, of where they went. So here is the England on the upper, well, I guess you can't see my mouse, but in the upper left is, is the UK um, and each each line um, connects the location that a bird spent the winter and spent the summer. Um, so that's what I wanna highlight is that all of them um, flew north for the winter. So instead of going south to an area where there's warmer, it's warmer and there's more food, like almost all the other birds that I know of, these black caps actually flew north to spend the winter in a, an area that was a bit colder um, certainly not as nice as a place like like Italy or Spain, um, where um, the, the climate is a, is a lot warmer. Um, and we think that that they're doing this because, and this change is happening um, for a combination of reasons, but a couple of them are people feeding birds more commonly. So now they have food that they can, they can um, use to survive during the winter or they, they hadn't been able to before. And we think that uh, as the winters become warmer, that uh, overall they're just better able to um, to pass the winter without suffering from a lack of food like they like they would have in the past. So there's lots of interesting things still to learn about these migrating birds. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about birds, I'd encourage you to uh, check out the Cornell Lab of Ornithology's website at birds.cornell.edu. Um, I'm not sure if any of you are, if any of you happen to be in middle school between fifth and eighth grade, um, there's currently a, a virtual birders club um, event that's happening. Um, but certainly if you're out of that age range, there's lots of exciting um, and fun learning tools as well on that website that you could check out. So um, thank you so much for, for listening and I'd be very happy to talk with you more, take any questions about migratory birds. All right, very cool. I'm wondering if the birds just heard there was good cake in the UK. And yeah. Why they switched their migration and started going the other way. Exactly. Very cool. I'm sure you could catch a few of the students watching today uh, with that same method with the cake and the <laughs> trap. Good stuff. Well, Ben, thanks so much for sharing that with us. Um, really cool research and, you know, a really interesting way of using science to solve 
a mystery. Why are the birds going north when most of them are going south? Uh, very cool. I want to ask you a little bit more about BirdCast because I took a, a little bit of time to, to head over to the website and, and look at some of the, the different forecasts. Can sure. you tell us a little bit about how those forecasts are generated? Absolutely. So the um, I will just go to a uh, change my slide back to one of the ones sure. that I use in the beginning, um, if that's all right. So he, here's an image from the, from the BirdCast website. And so this is a website that we uh, we operate birdcast.info um, that has both live migration maps and forecasts. So the the both of them um, operate using the the U.S.'s network of weather radars. So the the Weather Service, the the government agency that makes forecasts about the rain and the snow and um, you know predicts snow days and and all that sort of thing, um, they have a a network of, of radars that send beams of energy into the sky, into the atmosphere, um, and it reflects what reflects, sorry, um, everything in the atmosphere uh, reflects that energy back to the radar, which is how it figures out um, what's up there. And so this could be rain, it could be snow, it could be hail, but it can also be migratory birds that are up in the atmosphere. Um, so we can use this tool that's actually not designed for migrating, for monitoring migratory birds, to, um, to, to tune into bird migration, which I think is really neat. Um, and the forecast in particular um, resulted from us taking all of these radar data um, from, from this network of radars and combining it with lots of other information about the, the conditions that birds experience when they're migrating, like the, the winds and the temperature um, and the places that they're, that they're at and where they're going. Um, and we were able to develop a computer model to predict using that information how much um, migration we, we should expect to occur in a particular part of the country and a particular date and a time. All right, very cool. And is the hope that maybe uh, with these forecasts that we, we you can get certain cities maybe to switch off at different times? Absolutely. We have a, a, a light lights out initiative um, ongoing now. Um, and the, the hope our hope is that we can um, use our, our migration forecasts to advise people, wherever they may be, uh, when to expect a big night of bird migration. So migrating birds, um, they don't migrate every night. They wait for the conditions to be to be helpful for them. So if, if the winds are against them, blowing in their faces, they won't they won't migrate. Um, but if if the winds are are favorable, if they're um, giving them a boost, then they they will often migrate in large numbers. So, if we can predict when uh, those nights are going to happen and tell people uh, when to turn off their lights, uh, targeting those particular dates, then we can make a big difference without um, causing people too much inconvenience. All right, very cool. Great use of technology. So let's start meeting uh, some of the students and let's get uh, a few questions coming your way, Benjamin. So. I'm going to bring Mrs. Pocatera's group. They're joining us in Odessa. How are we doing, boys and girls? Hi, All right. Who's got a question for Ben, Jamin? Nice and loud. With the, with the bird cast, does, does the radar affect the birds? I'm sorry. Does radar, could you repeat that? Does the radar affect the birds? Oh, great, great question. Does the radar affect the birds? Um, uh, no, actually. So the, 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 the energy um, emitted by the radar, um, the, the birds um, don't, don't feel anything and, and, and can't, can't tell that anything is, is being pointed at them. So no, the, the radar doesn't um, affect the birds when they're migrating. So it's a great, a great way for us to to get a window onto what they're doing without um, influencing their behavior or, or impacting them. All right, very cool. We've got Mr. Southwards group joining us in Canada, I believe. Yeah. yeah. Catherine. All right, Ontario, perfect. And then look, we can see them virtually. How are we doing, boys and girls? <laughs> there you go, guys. You can kind of get seen here. There they are. Um, so, Katrina, did you want to ask your question? I don't know if. You'll be able to hear. Let's see if this works. 
Katrina, if you want to unmute. What was your... You hear that? Uh, Mr. Southward, I think the, the mic on the other computer is doing too good of a job at canceling uh, the sound. So the question was, Katrina wanted to know, how do you recapture these birds with backpacks? Oh, that's a is great question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Katrina. That's a great question. Um, that is probably the recapturing the birds that we we tagged one year, um, a year later, is one of the most challenging parts of, of the research that I did um, and, and probably takes the most effort. <laughs> um, so there are a couple of things that we we take advantage of when, when trying to catch them. One is to try and um, for, pick birds that we hope will come back to the same place the next year. Um, so in our case, we um, we put the, the backpacks on birds that were um, really enjoying spending their time in particular gardens, <laughs> um, particular backyards. So we tried to pick birds that we thought um, were likely to come back to that place. Um, because if they came back somewhere else, we wouldn't have any idea where where they were. Um, so we have to rely on the fact that some of them are going to come back, hopefully, to the same exact spot we caught them, which is just amazing because it, it means that they can navigate, you know, across thousands and thousands of miles um, and come back to the same exact spot year after year. Um, so when they come back to the same spot, that's just only part of the battle because then we have to um, try to catch them again. <laughs> um, so thankfully, so so this required really, um, to be honest, using the the cage traps with with food like the sponge cake, and then me waiting a really really long time um, for the individual birds that I wanted to catch to come back to the same trap, and then I would push a button, um, and and hopefully catch it. But it required a, a combination of luck, and um, and patience, and and a bit of of skill too. So it's not always glorious. Sometimes there's long periods of waiting uh, before you get what you want. Absolutely. But it looked like you had a good number of individuals. How many individuals did you were you able to recapture? We we caught um, we caught 24 individuals, um, but that so which is about one in five of the the ones that we initial we put the devices on, um, and a, a couple of them we got really lucky with because they. Uh, they didn't actually come back to the same place, but ended up at some other person's backyard. But that other person happened to be observant enough that they saw that there was a bird carrying a, a tracking device and wearing some colored rings on their legs um, and then contacted someone about it. And we were able to go um, catch that bird. Uh, but that, 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 that was pretty lucky. Um, that didn't happen too often, but it was really exciting when we, when we did manage to do that. All right. Well, I'm going to grab a question here from YouTube. And this question is about, um, you know, you mentioned light pollution as something that affects migratory birds. What are some other threats that they face on migration? Oh, that's also a great question. Um, th there's a long list, <laughs> um, but on, on migration in particular, so that migratory birds in general face a, a, a number of threats. Um, one of the, the biggest ones is habitat loss when um, Either human-caused um, changes to to the landscape will will reduce the amount of available um, habitat they have, be it forests or coastline, or depends on the bird species. But habitat loss, um, both where they spend the summer and the winter, and on the migratory route, um, is important because they have to be able to find places to to stop and and rest and find food to continue their journeys. Those are called stopover sites. And um, when we lose some of those, um, if we do, if, if habitat is lost in those areas, that could really affect um, their, the success of their migrations. Um, another challenge um, comes from, um, well, uh, outdoor, <laughs> outdoor cats actually seem to be a, a big problem as well. Um, and uh, the combination, I'd say the combination of, of light pollution and collisions with, with structures, um, I, I guess that, that there's, there are differences between um, what we call direct sources of mortality where in, 
birds are actually um, those individuals are are suffering, like colliding with the, with the building, um, and indirect sources where, like habitat loss, where it's not an individual being impacted, but the whole um, situation that uh, is experiencing um, a, a change that can be an, that can negatively impact the birds. So um, there, there are lots of different um, different sources of of challenges, unfortunately. Yeah, and I can imagine. I know there's you know certain stopover uh, places along the way, and if if that habitat is lost, that can have a huge impact on on their migration. If they were depending on maybe a source of energy or something. Absolutely, and there, there are some species that are very reliant on um, a small number of stopover sites, and there are other species that are are, are less reliant that can spread out over a wide area. And we think that the the birds that are are very much reliant on on a small number of sites. Um, Sometimes individual locations like um, the Delaware Bay is a very important stopover site um, that uh, any changes to those can have a, a particularly large impact. Okay. Let's bring in our class in Odessa again and see if they have another question for Benjamin. Hey, but I don't know if it's because you're down low, but we just kind of, that was really quiet. I wonder, do you want to try and stand up and talk a little louder for us? Maybe the mic will get you. Why is that type of favorite cake? Uh, I think I, I heard fa favorite. Yeah, I think favorite. he's wondering why the, why the bird's favorite food is cake. Oh. They put something like seeds? Yeah, was that your question? What? Why do they favor cake? Okay, great. Yeah, that that is a really interesting question too. Um, so, in 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 the winter, um, the the black caps, these birds are using a lot of um, a lot of energy just to stay warm, and so they need foods that have a lot of high high energy, um, high energy foods that have lots of especially lots of fats in them, and so so cake, cakes happen to be a a good example of a food with a lot of a lot of sugar, a lot of fats, a lot of energy for the birds uh, that they can burn um, to stay warm. And so it's not only not only cake, but other foods like um, uh, well, bird food that's suet, which is um, suet and other fatty um, fatty foods that they really like. Um, but they do sometimes eat seeds too, um, and we see them eating seeds and berries and and uh, insects when, when they can. Um, but in particular, I think the, those high energy foods are, are really important in the winter. All right. Let's head back to Mr. Southward's class in Cochrane, see if they have another question. All right. Um, so Jacob has a question. He was wondering, how do they fly so far? Especially when they're doing stopovers. Let's say they're stopping over in the north. Yeah. Is there always places to eat or... or you know, if, if snow starts to cover, do they have anything to eat? So how, how are they able to fly so far? That's a great question. Yeah, it's, it's such a, it's a very complex, um, it's hard to give an easy answer, a quick answer to that. <laughs> um, but so bir birds, these, these migratory birds have evolved over many thousands of years to, um, for their migrations to be finely tuned to the seasonal changes that occur. Um, so it being too cold um, can be a major issue, um, but but thankfully the birds that say eat insects they they have their migrations timed so that they generally leave before it gets too cold. So while they still have food, um, so timing their migrations correctly is really important for allowing them to um, have enough food to be able to to make the whole journey. Uh, so that's one important component of the successful migration is is proper timing. Um, they also have to be able to to find food in, in areas that they've never been before. And so that's, I think, a really fascinating aspect of it too, that they um, they hatch in the summer, uh, first year birds, they hatch in the summer and in a matter of weeks, they are, are ready to, to go, um, to migrate. Um, and a lot of their migrations are, are innate, um, that they, they are operating on instinct. So they're using their instincts um, just that, that tell them um, where to go, how far to fly, um, especially on their first migration. So 
it's amazing how much of it is actually um, just an instinct, instinct that that um, seems to work out in, in most cases. Um, if there's a particular, it's just a, a very a very large uh, question. <laughs> um, so I'm happy to talk in more specifics if if a student has a, a specific part of that question that I haven't touched on. Oh, I think it's definitely a complex question, and I think that's a really good important point in itself is we don't know everything yet um and you know oftentimes you go out in the field we, we talked about this this morning when we we talked to martin another uh person studying uh bird migration is that you can go out in the field with 10 questions but come back with 100 more because oh, yeah. that's just the nature <laughs> of science you, you figure out one thing but then that, that just leads to some more questions about it definitely i feel like i i in some ways i know less I feel like I know less than when I started because I just, I know how much I don't know now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So another question we have coming in here is about uh, gathering. So do most species gather before they migrate or are there solitary migrators as well? Absolutely, there, there are, there's a whole range. Um, many species do what we call stage um, when, when they gather before, before migration, um, stage in large numbers. Um, for example, a lot of aerial, very aerial birds that eat insects um, and fly around quite a bit, like swift swallows and swifts, they will form really big groups, um, and and other birds will will, will form flocks um, before migrating, and and still others will will just um, set off on their own, uh, especially those that sometimes their you know, their parents will migrate weeks before they will, and, and they'll just be left on the where, where they where they grew up essentially, um, and and have to find their way on their own, and, and often do without um, a constant group uh, of companions anyway. But but many of those that even migrate on their own, they do form um, they do form flocks that that change. So they'll you know they'll migrate and um, end up in a place to spend. You know, they'll migrate for a night wind up in, in a place to, to rest and, and, and refuel to find more food. And, and while they're doing that, they'll, they'll join up with other migrating birds. They'll form mixed species flocks with multiple species. Um, and we think that helps them find food and probably um, stay safe from predators as well. So they'll, they'll link up with other birds, even if they aren't um, staying with the same group on the whole trip. But there's a really large range of variation too. All right, very cool. So um to our classes who are live with us give me a wave if we need to visit uh your group again otherwise i have another question or two for you ben because we're running or benjamin we're running out of time uh in today's event so if you need me to visit your class again give me another wave otherwise i've got another couple of questions here uh for benjamin that we can use okay well i will fire another uh question your way uh okay. benjamin um Oh, never mind. Sorry, I just saw your screen share again. I thought uh, you were sharing something. <laughs> um, okay, so tall objects. You showed us the windmills. You showed us um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? The the, the cell towers and things like that. Is right. that you know you, you see those and you see the lights on them? You think they'd be relatively easy to avoid, but is it that light that's kind of warning planes as an attractant in the first place? Right. We we think that it. First, it, we talking about things we don't totally understand. Um, we aren't we aren't really sure exactly why birds are attracted to lights at night when they're migrating. Um, even we're, we we see moths and and bugs, uh, lots of insects that are also attracted to lights, as you, many of you have many probably seen at home. Um, and and yet we, scientists aren't sure exactly why that's the case either. Um, there, we have some ideas, um, but the why is still really a, a mystery. Um, but we know that they are attracted to lights. That, so that's the important thing, um, at least for knowing what to do about it. Um, and yes, for, for, the, for the, the towers, like the cell towers, um, especially steady lights that are um, on all the time um, seem to be, ha have a, more of an impact on birds than say lights that are blinking or or red lights that are a lower um, or longer wavelength, like a lower energy light. Um, 
is better for birds than a like a, a more blue light um, that is a higher energy, shorter wavelength. Um, so there are different kinds of, of colors and different blinking or, or uh, steady on lights that we could, um, decisions we could make that will improve the situation. Um, but uh, yes, it, it's definitely those, those um, especially steady on, steady burning lights um, on those, those tall buildings and towers that seem to uh, have the biggest impact. All right. Well, to the classrooms who tuned in today, definitely take some time to check out BirdCast uh, and check out those evening forecasts for bird migration. It's pretty cool. Uh, Benjamin, a huge thank you for joining us today and sharing some of the research that you're doing. I think that's, again, a really cool mystery, kind of finding out that, you know, you've got that species that's going north instead and then looking for those reasons why they might be doing that. So that's really cool. And then those who are uh, still tuning in at two o'clock, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into something we talked about with Benjamin, habitat. So Kristen Artus is going to join us and talk about grasslands and how important they are for bird, uh, especially birds that migrate and how they're disappearing and the impact that that is having on migratory birds. So Benjamin, thank you so much for joining us live today. Uh, great to have you hanging out with us. And uh, yeah, good luck with the research and hopefully we can figure out some more of these things and, what, and what's happening with our migratory birds. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Um, and let me know if you want to talk any more, any of you. Perfect. All right. Well, thanks again, everyone. We're going to sign off from today's event.